Let me give you the reasons as to why I am Catholic and not Orthodox. What started in the Great Schism ends in heresy. Right guys, thanks for tuning in. Um, this is gonna be quite a deep video. I'm expecting quite a lot of reactions down in the comments. Hopefully I get some kind of viewership and some, you know, some, some kind of counter comments down below. I'll try my best to respond to all of them, but I'm not gonna engage in any kind of arguing. Um, I'm expecting quite a few of you to be atheist. Uh, atheists or agnostics or um, you know full back spiritualists you might have you know a, a religious upbringing but for what kind of political reason you don't really follow it anymore and you've sort of fallen back onto spiritualism I'm also expecting a few comments from Islamists and I'm expecting uh, quite a few comments from uh, members of all the different heretical churches that uh, exists across the globe. Um, about myself, I've been uh, an atheist myself for much of my life. I'm a little bit ashamed to admit that right now. Um, I think I've lost a lot of time, a lot of valuable time, um, but I've dipped into various different religions. I've many, many, you know, been in a, a metropolitan Western city um, a lot of people have tried to, you know, convert me or revert me over to their religion, but it's been unsuccessful thus far. I've kind of found myself to Catholicism quite naturally. Um, it m might appeal to my mentality, I don't know. Um, and that's something I don't want to knock my orthodox brethren, okay? Because I think we might just have a different cultural mentality between us uh, you guys in the east you've got an emphasis on philosophy mysticism is big um, an ideology but mysticism I would say characterizes my awful brethren quite well whereas us in the west it might be I don't know some remnant of the Roman Empire but um, our mentality is more towards uh, the practical uh, and the legal so that's probably why you're seeing um, the Holy See, the Roman Catholic Church, you know, actually uh, following more of a legal structure, you know, laying down rules and stuff like that, laying, you know, taking a deciding um, infallible position on a point, okay? What I'm going to do is, yeah, so I'm going to, I'm going to go through these points, I'll timestamp them if I've got time down in the description otherwise just follow along um, I guess we should jump in there this could be a long video um, I've got some notes and some of it I'm just you know just freestyling it so you maybe cut me a little bit of slack also my pronunciation is not all that good on a lot of these things on a lot of these terms but you know bear with me you can correct me in the comments if you want right number one Took us about nearly four minutes to get into that. Number one, the Orthodox Church is not one. Okay, Christ, now check this out, Christ declared that his church would be one fold under one shepherd. But there is no agreed authority among the Orthodox churches, plural. You guys, you Orthodox guys, my brethren, my brothers in Christ, you cannot get past this one, this point number one, I'm sorry. There are at least, I don't know, off the top of my head, about 15, maybe more, probably more, but let's go comfortably with 15, different Orthodox churches existing independently of one another. Like all schismatical churches it has ended by splitting up into further divisions that's probably why i don't know how many there are right now 
Just as there is no united Protestantism, there is no one united Orthodox Church. And it, it pains me to say, guys, Orthodoxy and the Protestants are very similar, I'm very sorry to say. Um, so that was point one. Point two, the Orthodox Church doesn't claim infallibility. Yeah, I know this is a big one for you guys, but you don't claim it. Uh, it has no way of deciding matters of faith or morals infallibly. What is its teachings on birth control, on divorce, IVF, medical and health ethics? You don't have it. On all these vital matters, it has no authoritative or binding statement. When asked about the orthodox position on birth control, um, Patriarch Bartholomew, uh, he's the Greek orthodox archbishop of Constantinople. Uh, he basically replied in a Time magazine article way back in 97. Um, according to a long held tradition, uh, the Greek Orthodox Church avoids dictating or making categorical decisions of a social or ethical nature. Basically, you guys don't even have a church. What are you even doing? If you cannot come down on one side or another on such important matters, what, do you, what, is, what are your congregations doing? What are you doing? in one of these churches. Point three, the Orthodox Church isn't Catholic, uh, Catholic with a small c. Uh, so that in this case, it means it isn't universal, for example. Uh, it is mostly confined to the Greeks and the Slavs and their descendants, you know, wherever they are in their immigrant communities across the world. Um, it's only about 200 million um, in, in, the, in one of these churches, uh, if you put these churches together. Um, and it doesn't make much missionary effort. It's probably back to its uh, disorganized structure. It's, it's probably, I don't know, it's probably dying. Point four, the Orthodox Church is not apostolic. Okay? It's not. You're not going to get past this, okay? It lacks the continued juridictual succession of apostolic authority. The Orthodox Church acknowledges a bond with definitely um, heretical churches. So. Uh, but they acknowledge no real bond with the Catholic Church. It's, it's a bad, it's a sorry state of affairs that we, the schism has caused this much damage. Um, they reflect, sorry, they reject the unity that only the Church of Christ can give and therefore lack the supreme spiritual authority of the papacy. They tried uniting around the uh, Patriarchate of Constantinople, but that wasn't sufficient to prevent secular princes demanding a separation church for each kingdom. Yeah. Check out this, uh, this verse, Matthew 18, 17. A unity of reverence isn't enough. Only a unity of obedience suffices. And here's the quote, if a man will not hear the church, let him be as the heathen. So uh, that, that definitely apply, applies to um, my Protestant friends. Um, and you can see with the Church of England how far they have gone, they, how far low they have become. Um, and I don't think that is something the Orthodox Church would withstand. I, uh, when I say withstand, I think um, pressures of liberalism, modern liberalism, capitalism, uh, the way society is going, 
the Church of England fell only because it is more prevalent um, in the West. And you can see how there's a, how there's a schism happening with um, African congregations uh, in Protestantism. Um, and I just think there is nothing in Orthodoxy that will weather that. And in fact, they're, they're going to be more susceptible when these forces reach into their parts of the world. Um, the fact that they can't decide on simple doctrinal matter, matters means they're going to be uh, easy fodder for um, the woke liberalist agenda, revolutionary agenda. Point five, the patriarchs of Constantinople were all subject to the Pope. I'll oh, grant it at first, okay. They were all subject to the Pope. I had to repeat it there. You can't get past this one, guys. Before the Great Schism commenced by Photius, 800 something, uh, the patriarchs of Constantinople were all subject to the Pope. There was no patriarchs of the Greek Orthodox Church. The first council of Constantinople, 300 something, I'm sorry guys, uh, some of this I'm just speaking off the cuff, okay? For example, demanded that the Bishop of Constantinople should rank next after the Bishop of Rome. And therefore the bishops of Alexandria and Antioch uh, the Eastern bishops, um, sorry, uh, and before um, Antioch and Alexandria. The Eastern bishops affirmed at the end of the council, um, I'm going to pronounce this wrong, Chalcedon, I know it was in the middle of the 400s. Uh, Peter has spoken by Leo. A century and a half later, Pope Gregory I wrote, Who doubts? the Church of Constantinople is subject to the Apostolic See? Question mark. The Patriarch of Constantinople and all the Eastern bishops signed the formula of Hormistas, pronounce that wrong, I'm sorry, who was Pope from, I think it was Pope from about 500 to about 10 years or so, from 510 to 520 something. Um, that formula contained these words, okay, quote, We follow the apostolic see in everything and teach all its laws. I hope to be in that one communion taught by the apostolic see in which is the whole real and perfect solidity of the Christian religion. The whole of Christendom was behind the Pope, all the way up to the schism. You can't get past that one, guys. I'm sorry. Point six, politics, not doctrine, created or started the great schism. Okay, politics, not doctrine. Um, I'm going to go into a history lesson here. Uh, around 800 something, missionaries from Constantinople converted the Bulgarians to bring them under the jurisdiction of the Latin Patriarchate of the West, rather than have them under the Patriarchate of Constantinople. Uh, Pope Nicholas I appointed bishops for the Bulgarians in eight. 160 something, 66 I think. But uh, partly this was also to maintain Rome's political authority over Constantinople. Maintain, not create, but maintain, as agreed in the previous point. Um, okay. And the Greeks resented, they, resent, they resented this. Photius, Patriarch of Constantinople, wrote to the Pope, 867, condemning the Catholic Church. Although, provo although provoked politically, he also made various doctrinal charges. Okay, so he, he sort of added on 
some further issues, but we know it was politics. The schism started when the Pope excommunicated uh, Photius, who retaliated, rightly so he was excommunicated, uh, who retaliated by excommunicating the Pope. He couldn't do that. He did something he was not able to do. That's the schism. Uh, after, after Photius made peace with Pope John VIII, um, he was duly recognized as Patriarch of Constantinople. So there was some forgiveness and he made it good. This reconciliation lasted until Photius died. But then trouble started again. After various difficulties, the then Patriarch of Constantinople renewed the break with Rome in 1054 okay and that's that's pretty much how it's been now okay that's that's the point uh, he wanted to be universal patriarch over the whole church appealing to the political importance of Constantinople he won over the emperor and since then the patriarchs of Constantinople haven't submitted the jurisdiction haven't submitted to the jurisdiction of the Pope or sought his confirmation for their appointments. Check this now. But the Greek, but the, <laughs> the Greek, but the Greek delegates uh, to the Second Council of Loins in 1274 and the Council of Florence in 1439 admitted that they should. Okay, they should submit to the jurisdiction. Um, for, of, of the Pope in Rome for their uh, appointments. So, so they admitted that they should. They sought a return to unity with Rome. Yes, my Orthodox brethren, we were almost back on track. On each occasion, however, on their return to the East, politics, national interest repudiated their admissions unfortunately it's a it's a political schism point seven i think we're nearly done but there's i think there's a another point or two that we can go with here opposition this is what i said at the start of the video opposition to the papacy defines orthodoxy i'm sorry guys yeah it does The Orthodox churches are in agreement with Catholics on most things, yeah? You know that as well as I do. We agree on pretty much everything. The main difference is the, in, the primacy and infallibility of the Pope, which they did previously submit to. For example, the Greek churches believed in the Immaculate Conception until the advent of Protestantism. They had nothing against the doctrine in itself, even under pressure of Protestant opinion. Although they wavered, they, or you if you're an Orthodox, if you're an Orthodox brethren watching this, you never denied it. The denial only came when the Pope defined the doctrine 1854, merely because they were opposed to the Pope. That's it. They wished to manifest their opposition, basically to validate themselves and, and their churches and their stance and, you know, why the Great Schism took place. Point eight. What starts in Schism ends in heresy I'm sorry guys heresies start by either denying the teachings of the Catholic Church or by rebelling against her authority here's, here's how I would see it okay the, the Gnostics the Manichians the Arians the Nestorians started with doctrinal error and ended in defying the authority of Rome 
similarly Protestantism started with denial uh, of teaching and ended by a denial of authority okay but the Greek church started by defying authority the authority of Rome and has ended by denying some points of Catholic teaching now if you're in one of the Orthodox churches right now you probably know what a few of them are if you're an outsider from all of this that's going on if you're a Catholic where uh, and we're unaware I'm, I'm gonna list pretty much the, the, the differences okay um, number one maybe these are topics for other videos I might do them I might not um, the Holy Ghost proceeds from both father and son the supremacy and infallibility of the Pope the right to give communion under one kind only the Catholic doctrine um, of the particular and general judgments the Catholic doctrine on the nature of purgatory and what I, one that I mentioned earlier the, the Immaculate Conception which was no problem all the way up until the mid 1800s um, that's it guys that's pretty much it um, I read a book quite a while ago I have it in my journal um, let me get my journal my reading journal because I do keep notes um, the book is called through the East to Rome um, published in 1931 and basically the author uh, I got a feeling he was a Protestant I, I can't quite remember basically he says that after spending time in the East as an Anglican um, working for the reunion of Greeks and Anglicans it's a virtuous mission uh, he realized it was impossible and I wrote down this um, this excerpt from from the book compared to the Roman Catholic Church the so-called Orthodox Church is just a collection of fossilized and moribund fragments of what was once a great and living church indeed it seems to me to be a great object lesson in the disastrous consequences of abandoning the rock on which the Church of Christ was built. <laughs>